We are very happy and proud to be launching this uh, series, which is going to be part of our work, in-depth work this year on faith and public life. In a moment, Rabbi Shuli Paso will contextualize and explain what a wonderful opportunity we have together as a community to uh, go into this journey together for the entire year. I just wanted to say how happy I am that we're all together to begin on this journey and particularly happy that uh, my friend Professor Moshe Halbert, somebody I, who has written and thought uh, uh, about this subject in particular, many other subjects over many, many years, and somebody I have uh, looked up to and admired for many years is actually the first lecture uh, on this series, and now I'd like to ask Rabbi Shuli Paso to explain how this came about and what it is about and, uh, and, and uh, what we're going to be experiencing, uh, learning uh, during the course of the year. Thank you, Roly. Thank you, everyone, for being here tonight. On December 6th, 1987, there was a massive rally in Washington, D.C. It was a Soviet Jewry rally. Maybe some of you were there. I was there. I was 11 years old. I took the bus down from Philadelphia, where I grew up, with uh, my family and my classmates. And being 11 years old, I didn't quite understand the magnitude of uh, the issue of Soviet Jewry and what it, what it was we were going to do. So I was asking my father about it. And what, what is this all about? Why are we going? And I remember distinctly him saying, we are going because we take responsibility for people outside of our immediate community. Right? And this is what we do as Jews. We take responsibility for people outside of our immediate community. We stand up, we act on our values. And that rally and my father's words had a really big impact on me. That was a, a formative experience. It was my first political experience. And in many ways, it set me on the path that I have been on for the rest of my life. And I think many of us have stories like this, right? Stories about uh, an experience or a person who influenced us, helped to shape our values, influenced the way we see the world, or inspired us to act on the things that we care about. And institutions have stories like this, too. Many of BJ's stories are stories of the influence of Rabbi Marshall T. Meyer and Rabbi Abraham Joshua Heschel, whose teachings and whose actions created a legacy here of institutional commitment, institutional commitment to engaging in some of the most pressing social and political issues of the day, and rooting that in Jewish values doing that work as an expression of Jewish values. And that, was not always been, that has not always been without controversy. And since the presidential election last year and the campaign leading up to it and the months coming after it, many of us here in this community and in the clergy and I think in our world have been asking, um, how does this legacy, and particularly at BJ, how does BJ's legacy and the Jewish tradition and the history in which it is rooted obligate us to respond and reflect in new ways, and different ways perhaps, to the social and political reality in which we find ourselves in this country right now? How does BJ's legacy obligate us to better understand and confront the suffering and the hatred that has existed for a long time in our world, but for many of us feels like it is waxing and not waning? And we're seeing even more of that. How does the BJ legacy obligate us to understand our situation more fully and to improve our work, to improve our practice of social change so that we might address deep-rooted problems with more sustainable solutions and we might be more effective in the work that we are doing? And the initiative that we're embarking on this year, Faith in Public Life, builds on BJ's history and BJ's legacy and its core values. And it's really designed to engage more people in the expansion and the refinement of our social change work. 
and how we do that as a Jewish spiritual community. But that is not the only story. So on April 5th, 1992, there was another major rally in Washington, D.C. It was a reproductive rights rally. Maybe some of you were there. So I was 15 years old, and I was discussing with my father again whether or not I was going to go to this rally. And my father said, I think you shouldn't go. I think you shouldn't go, and instead, you should write an op-ed for your school newspaper about why you weren't there. So my first inclination was to say that my father was a sexist, misogynist for saying this, and to run out of the room and slam the door. But I'm glad I didn't. I'm glad I had the presence of mind to be a little bit curious and to ask him why he said that. So he said, I believe abortion should be legal, but I have mixed feelings about it. And I'm pretty sure I'm not going to agree with everything that's going to be said at that rally. This is a nuanced issue, and it's very hard to talk about nuanced issues and to talk about issues in nuanced ways at a rally of thousands and thousands of people. So I imagine that this story may be making some of you uncomfortable right now, um, perhaps because of how you feel about this issue or you've had personal experience with this issue, and that's really not my intention. Just want to be clear. My intention is really to highlight what my father said, because I think there was a lot of wisdom in that. So whether you agree or disagree with his views about the rally, he was really right about one thing. It is very hard, maybe impossible, to have a nuanced conversation at a rally of thousands and thousands of people. It is hard to have a nuanced conversation with one person when you're talking about an issue that you care very passionately about, that you believe in, in your heart of hearts, that is an expression of your core values. Your position on that issue is an expression of your core values. And so when someone disagrees with you, it's not just a matter of disagreement, but it's feeling that there's a threat to your core values. And I think there's a growing feeling among many in this country that this political moment calls not only for a recommitment to our values and to putting them into more effective action, but also for a recommitment or maybe a new commitment for some of us to nuanced conversation, to openness, to listening to people with different perspectives, to other stories without demonizing those people who see things differently to dialoguing across difference and listening with curiosity, and to seeking to understand, not necessarily to agree, but to understand. And this is a second element of the Faith and Public Life Initiative, why we are doing this this year, to have a more nuanced conversation, as we've done at BJ with other controversial issues, like last year's JIBC, initiative, and several years ago, the Israel Dialogue Initiative, were not new to this type of listening and this type of work. And over the course of the year, we want to hear from diverse voices, both within our community and from outside of our community, and to engage in some reflection and introspection about how our country arrived at the moment we're at right now. And what do we need to learn? What do we need to do? What relationships do we need to build? and how we ourselves may need to change if we want to build a stronger community and a stronger society. Because what got us into this situation is a pretty complex story. There are four core animating questions that we're going to explore over the course of the year through Faith and Public Life. And the programming for this initiative includes this public lecture series, which we're kicking off tonight study materials that are being produced in partnership with Mahon Hadar, trainings and workshops, community events to learn more about specific issues, and tzedek minyanim, small groups that are going to be learning and acting together. So not every program and not every event and aspect of this initiative will explore each of the four questions, but they'll all provide an opportunity to dig in and reflect on at least one, and together those questions will provide a thread that runs through the year. So the format for tonight is going to incorporate these questions. Um, and in some ways, it may be a little different from some of the lectures that you may have been to here at BJ. First, we're going to hear from our speaker, Professor Moshe Halbertal. 
And immediately after that, I'm going to ask you to break into pairs or small groups just with the folks around you for some conversation. Conversation about what you heard in the remarks, conversation and reflection on the four animating questions, which are on your handout. And we'll then come back together to hear some report outs from these small group conversations and some Q&A with Professor Halbertal before we close. So with that, it's a great pleasure and a privilege to introduce Professor Moshe Halbertal. I had the honor of studying with him when I was doing my master's degree at NYU, and he was teaching as he does most years at the law school. He's a professor of Jewish thought and philosophy at Hebrew University in Jerusalem and the Gross Professor at the NYU School of Law. He is the author of many, many, many books, including People of the Book, Canon, Meaning, and Authority, Maimonides, Life and Thought, and his latest book this year, The Beginnings of Politics, Power in the Biblical Book of Samuel. In 2010, Halbertal was named a member of Israel's Academy for the Sciences and the Humanities, and we are very pleased to have him here tonight. Well, good evening, and uh, thank you. It's a great honor. Thank you for inviting me to address you. Um, you know, I'm a big admirer of this community from many years. Uh, have colleagues who are members of this community. I, I told Rolly I keep on uh, getting a lot of naches from people who were here, and we are addressing a complex issue in complex times. I want to start with uh, the following observation. Uh, since, the, since the emancipation, Jews have uh, lived in a hyphenated identity. By that I mean there, there were German Jews and British Jews and French Jews. Uh, and um, and um, this, this is a phenomenon of modernity. Rashi wasn't a French Jew. He was a Jew living in France, an Ashkenazi, but not a French Jew. Uh, Maimonides wasn't um, a Castilian Jew or a Spanish Jew. He was a Sfaradi, uh, etc. It is in the, in the modern life that uh, a realm of neutral space between the Jew and the non-Jew began to be shaped, where citizenship is a common feature, the hallmark of that is the capacity of marrying, civil marriage, creating the most deepest human bond outside the church and the synagogue. This is a new reality we're in. I think Spinoza was the first Jew actually to leave the Jewish community without converting to Christianity. Basically, he elbowed the neutral space in his own thinking and reality. And this is fact of our life. By the way, one, one very important feature, uh, this hyphenation was very unstable for European Jews, as we know. The German Jewish identity wasn't stable, to say the least. But American Jewish hyphenation is a blessing, because in Germany, the only hyphenate people were the Jews. Others were Germans, and there was a German Jew. Well, in America, we are all hyphenated, African-American, Jewish-American, Italian-American, etc. This is not, in that respect, a, a thoroughly clear-cut nation state. Jews are citizens of this state. And I want to approach this problem to begin with as citizens. Uh, let's leave aside the moment the Jewish perspective. By the way, I'm a, I'm a citizen of another country of Israel, right? By the way, believe me, it's a full-time job, uh, right? Full-time job. I, I tend to run my country in my head all the time. Uh, my friends claim that I am the most experienced statesman and politician there ever existed. When I meet someone else that does it, we even form a government. So, so we are, uh, citizenship is a big, big feature of our life. And I want to address first the question as citizens. As citizens, where we are at, 
Now, this is not only, I think, a, an American, a US issue. I think it's a, it's a global problem. Israel, Europe, other things. Something about the liberal humanistic order is being challenged in a serious way. And there is a call for action. Now, by the way, as citizens, we disagree about many things. We disagree about taxation. We disagree about uh, different forms and ideas of distributive government. We disagree about uh, distributive justice. We dis disagree about the role of government. We disagree about foreign politics. We, dis we have many disagreements. And, uh, and, uh, but, but I think what's unique now in the age or in some anxiety that is awoken by this condition is that the very framework of, con on, of continuing this conversation and disagreement is being challenged. The very framework. And I want to address three issues that I seem to me seem to me there it's very rare in nations life i think where where what's at stake and what needs to be defended is the framework to have an argument it's a rare moment and i think we are to a certain degree in that moment and i want to talk about three issues the first one and there is a, there, there is a straightforwardness to that but i hope i can conceptualize it in a fruitful way the first one is democracy, the essence of democracy is a non-violent procedure to adjudicate disagreements. It's a beautiful thing. A non-violent procedure. It's a way of living together in differences. Why? Because we agree on a shared procedure to adjudicate those differences. Now, when a candidate to president is says ahead of time, and this is a new moment in political argument, that elections will be rigged. Then after the election, he challenges his own election in terms of what happened. Or that he will lock, how, we, how did they say? Lock her up. Or that he will imprison his rival as if this is the winner take all process, as if this is Egypt. Or when he says something, to a certain degree, even worse. That the prior president, the prior beloved president, was an illegitimate president. That he has basically stalled the presidency. This is a new phase in, in, uh, in political discourse. And again, it's not about this or that policy. It's not a policy debate. It's, about, it's a debate about the possibility of having policy debates. And by the way, in that, you always gesture, this is something we know from history, you always gesture that you are not really ahead of a party, that the democratic process is just a facade for other forces at work, that you are heading a movement, not a party. This is, uh, it rings very familiar and, and kind of unsettling. And this needs to be defended. I want to I talk about Israel in this respect. I just want to say, there's one feature about Israeli debate that I'm sure you all know, it's a very high temperature debate high stakes, right? I'm taking my own home, the family I grew in. My mother, she is much more hawkish than me. She votes to the right, I would say even to the far right. She thinks my policy is a real danger to her grandchildren. I mean my own children. If the country will follow my way, they will be in real risk. Existentially, not uh, you know, taxation of middle class. Or, no, existential risk. I think that with her policy, my, ch my children, my grandchildren will be, uh, 
will be a minority in their own country at the end, in a one state that, that, that is not going to be Jewish democratic in the way we want it. You can imagine we try to avoid talking politics, right? Especially in the Seder, Passover. <laughs> I once told my, my mother after the Seder, not my mother, my brother, you know, I think, I think the Seder is Pharaoh's revenge, actually. <laughs> now, I want to say something about high temperature politics, and this is something that is about this idea of the capacity to adjudicate differences with a non-violent procedure. When, when you have high stake politics and temperature is very high, usually democracies do not like it. They want to lower the margins of debate because if the debate is existential, then for the other side, it's very difficult to accept the results of the, the elections. On the one hand, on the other hand, actually, it's a very great boost to democracy because it creates huge participation. You know, Israeli democracy is a, is a participatory democracy or high level, right? Huge uh, uh, percentage of vote. There are sectors who vote more than 100%. <laughs> right? Some known sectors, right? More than 100% voting. So there is a huge participation, right? But I, I as someone who cares about the, uh, the democracy in, in my country, I said, let's try to lower the temperature. Let's try to lower the stakes. I'm not sure that this procedure will hold given the, the high temperature. By the way, I just want to say one, one traumatic moment for Israeli democracy is the murder of Yitzhak Rabin. By the way, the murder of Yitzhak Rabin didn't come from I mean, there was incitement. That wasn't the issue. If you listen to the murderer, and we, sh we should listen to these people, what made him murder is, a th is the idea that the government doesn't have legitimacy to make decisions about the future of the land of Israel. It's an illegitimate government. Here we shift from the language. You know that democracy is in problem when you shift from the language of mistake, the other is mistaken, to the language of sin, the other is a sinner. So one thing I think very important in those days, in these days, I'm saying in Israel as well, here, not only here, is to protect the most elemental element of democracy, which is this is a shared, agreed upon procedure to adjudicate differences between us. And this is challenged by someone, again, is not clearly is the head of a party or plays the democratic game. He's the head of a movement of sorts. I want to talk about the second thing. I said three things as citizens. As citizens. The second thing, no less important, it's that words and facts have weight. Uh, Thucydides says in, in his great work on the Peloponnesian wars, wars, this is a fourth century BC story, and he says something very important. He says, You all, always know that in civil war, or when the fabric of society collapses, words lose their meaning. We, we shift from words to slogans. Why is it so important? Because democracy is ruled by argument. It's a genius idea. It's ruled by argument, meaning if you have convinced enough of us, you have the legitimacy to be the ruler. It's a rule by argument. Legitimacy is by convincing. Not by, you didn't seize the, 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 uh, the uh, office by revolution, by, by heredity, but it's a rule by argument. By the way, but when facts and words lose their weight, what you don't have is what? Argument. 
By the way, I always think this is a challenge to democratic discourse, not only in these times. I always have these very uh, sad thoughts. You know, you see campaigns being run by uh, advertisement companies. And what is the, 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 pro, the big problem of democratic discourse is a fine line between argument and manipulation. Very fun line, fine line. And I, I sometimes have this iconoclastic fantasy. The second commandment, we don't want to see pictures or images. Let's go back to the radio. By the way, Ben-Gurion wouldn't have been elected today. It just doesn't have the proper looks. It doesn't project an image or whatever. And also, maybe the end of the soundbite. If you have something to say, say it in a coherent way for five minutes. Let's see if you can make an argument. But there is, there is a breakdown, especially now, especially now, of the weight of words and facts, which are the most prior, most important thing for a culture that claims that authority and government you gain by argument and convincing. Well, I many times think as a teacher, as a teacher of humanities, there is also a crisis in, in education in the humanities all over. It's connected. What is a good education in the humanities? You want the student to be very open to argument, very open to argument and immune to manipulation. And then by discarding facts, by claiming that words do not matter, you create what I call the charisma of ignorance. And where actually when you say something, you're not arguing with the other side. You're winking to your base as if you outsmarted anybody here or as if you're so powerful that you can even bend facts. So what the second thing, I'm saying now a citizen, the second thing, most important thing, is to reestablish the dignity of the word and the dignity of the fact, which is dramatically being eroded for many reasons. I want to talk about the third thing. Now, the third thing for me is the most important issue. We talked about democracy as a nonviolent procedure of adjudicating differences. We talked about the power of words and arguments, rule by argument, discussion. I always think, now this is closer to the Israeli context, but it's not only the Israeli context. I always think, what's exactly the difference between nationalism and ultra-nationalism, the alt whatever? What do they mean by that? When does a movement or country, a society, moves from nationalism to ultra-nationalism. I mean, this is a concern for me, for my own country as well. And I say there is one very important feature to that, one very important feature. And that's for me always the signature that we have passed that line, which is ultra-nationalist movement look for the enemy inside. The enemy is inside. Now I say, our prime minister, our prime minister, I'm talking about Israel, in the election day, when he wanted to mobilize his voters, he said the Arabs are coming masses in buses to vote. Basically what you say, a group of citizens is the enemy inside. And then, that will be a marker. You move against the court system, against the media, against the NGOs, the enemy is inside. This is what we call the world of urban in Hungary, the world of ultranationalism in, in, in Poland, other countries, etc. This is the main marker of ultranationalism. When a leader 
is looking for the enemies inside. By the way, that allows leadership to do something else. And that has been done many times by different forces. It's to be in power by claiming that they're actually not ruling the country. Because there are all other forces that are still holding on. They're just outsiders. They're not really ruling the place. They need a, an immediate relationship to activate the populace because actually they don't have control. That allows them a lot of excuses and other things. So you look for the enemies outside, inside. By the way, I want to say one thing. The, the Israeli right, which have a very good argument, serious argument, shifted, or some parts of it shifted from hawkish liberal nationalism to ultra-nationalism when they began that language of the enemy inside. When someone says, you know, the problem of Israel is the NGOs, it's breaking the silence. This is the problem. We should investigate whom they get money from, who this, who that, who that. You know you have moved to ultra-nationalism. Now, I want to say something else about, and, and Rabbi Shuli, you mentioned that issue. I think it's very important for the conversation. This includes also my camp, our camp, if we can talk this language. You know, I, I have, uh, I've learned a lot in Israel in that respect. The voter that, we, as I said, we have existential differences. And Israeli democracy is, in that respect, a miracle. Serious miracle. Can be unraveled very easily. We have 20% minority, Arab minority. By the way, a minority is in a very complex situation. Its country is at war with its nation. Usually countries, democratic countries, do not handle this condition very well. We have seen what happened here to the Japanese, what happened to German citizens in England. In that respect, Israel is a, is a still you know, way to go about these issues, but quite remarkable. It's very easy to unravel this commonality in playing the enemy from within, because the enemy from within then reacts as an enemy, which is a further reason why to claim that he's an enemy. We know that. But I want to say something about the, the, right, the, the, the right, the opponent, the political opponent. And the only way also of, we talked about argument, convincing. The Israeli hawkish right wing, the sort of the Likud voter, is not a moral monster. Not at all. He has actually serious concerns. He has seen since... Uh, 1990, he's seen attempts at peace that ended up in bloodshed. He's afraid that if we we'll give up territories, Hamas will control our airport, Tel Aviv, etc., etc. He's concerned. The last thing you want to do is to be super ego. People dislike their super egos for good reasons. You have to say, look, you got a problem here, it's serious. We have other problems as well that you have to be aware of. And uh, your concern has to be addressed if we want to address and you know, to win elections, to move some people from one side to the other. It cannot be merely politics by moral blame. I mean, you know more about the US. I'm, I've been here, I've been here many times I'm not, I missed what I call the introductory classes in elementary school that always, there are some things I don't know, you know, I don't know, sometimes I don't know, right? How time, for example, is time. Time for me is, a, how, how do locals relate to time? It's a big issue for me. I mean, I mean, culture, you begin to schmooze, you end up in two hours 
This is kind of a non-American thing. So, uh, so there, I'm, again, I'm speaking as an observer. But, you know, many, many of the Trump voters, many of them are not moral monsters, you know. They have concerns, they have genuine concerns. By the way, some of them voted for Barack Obama the last elections. Some of them voted for Sanders in the primaries. And uh, their concerns have to be taken seriously. Now, clearly, some very ugly other voices are piggybacking on those concerns. But you're not going to change, you're not going to shift by merely um, cornering them or framing them as, as um, moral, uh, how did uh, Hillary say in one moment, an unsuccessful moment in the campaign, I forgot the, uh, yeah, deplorables. They're not deplorables. There, there, some of them are, you know, serious concerns, serious problems. You have to address them. You have to relate to them. By the way, I'm saying, now I'm, I'm talking, whatever I'm saying, I'm, I'm talking to myself, basically, and talking to myself in Israel, because I know how do the left, center left in Israel can break the gridlock, can break the gridlock only by taking seriously the arguments of the other side and addressing them within their overall plan. So we, we talk about three issues. Now I'm saying these three issues that I've mentioned are not about this or that argument, are not about disagreements that we have that are serious, legitimate. They are about the very framework of having a disagreement, which is one, maintain this idea that, that this is a cherished Nonviolent procedure of adjudicating differences, one. Second, the weight of facts and words. So we can have a rule by argument. And third, beware of the orientation of identifying the enemy inside. And it takes different forms. I've seen how it works here, there, and, and many other places. Now you ask yourself, okay, this is all good as citizens, so what do we do as Jews? You know, not all the time you have to act in the world as a Jew. Sometimes you do. And in this framework, I think it's a very important question. And I want to talk about two uh, two, um, I would say, two centers of gravity to my understanding, my, my understanding of this issue. Well, we, would, we can cast it as the universal call of the particular. Jews acting outside the interest, the concerns of their own particular community. What's the role of that within Jewish life? Now, all serious life, this is a philosophical argument that I, I believe in. All serious deep life is particular. All form of life that is serious is particular. It has language, it has musical traditions, it has liturgy, it has sacred text. That's what makes a form of life deep, thick, there isn't such a thing as a universal form of life. I've yet to meet the universal man or woman. There isn't such a thing. Wherever that person emerges, he emerges as a particular. First of all, he talks a language. That's already plenty. And he has calendar and initiation rites. And a whole, what we mean by culture, aesthetics, music, everything. Everything that is deep, and meaningful in that respect is particular. Some of my colleagues want to be cosmopolitans. By the way, even cosmopolitans are not an embodiment of universalism. What they are embodiment in the best case of few cultures, particular cultures, melding into another particular culture. 
which is good. You know, I met in my life only one cosmopolitan person genuinely. You have to know so much to, to be a cosmopolitan. When I was growing up in Montevideo, not far from Roli, uh, I was a child. In my home lived a, a figure, a, a legendary figure, was a friend of my, my father and mother, uh, Professor Shoshani. He's a known genius, in a, it's kind of a legend. And uh, he knew basically every language there is. The deal between him and my father was he didn't have money or didn't like to spend money, whatever. The deal was that he lives at home, doesn't pay rent, but my father is a Holocaust survivor, Eastern European Jew, was fixated in world politics. Every week he gives him a summary of all newspapers in all European languages. <laughs> Now, uh, my mother once pressed Shoshani, asked him, uh, Shoshani didn't say what his name was. He called himself Shoshani, that wasn't his name. He, she asked him, how did you survive the Holocaust? He's, he was in Europe. He said, look, I was in Vichy. They caught me, the Gestapo, and uh, they saw I'm circumcised, etc. So I said to them, I'm a Muslim. They brought a Qadi to examine me. The Qadi said, not only is a Muslim, he's a saint. <laughs> he just knew, you know, that's, uh, some rare people can be cosmopolitans in that sense, right? Every meaningful, every meaningful life, serious meaningful life, is embedded in a particular tradition. Universalism is a constraint. It's not a form of life. I want to say even something deeper. All serious universalism, by that I mean serious commitment of a particular group to people outside its particular group, is cast in the language of that particular tradition. And it gets depth and meaning from that particular tradition. And we want to think, right, we want to think about, I don't know, the civil rights movements here. It was cast in a deep religious tradition by Martin Luther King. And in our tradition, we just were reading Bereshit, Right? Our st story, which is, by the way, a particular story, very particular story, the story of Bereshit. It is start with Adam. This is a particular version of our universal commitment. There is Adam. The story doesn't start with Abraham. Neither start with Exodus. Starts with Adam. And the framing of the universal commitment is through a very particular concept, by the way, religiously loaded, Tselem Elohim, an image of God. You know, you can think, by the way, of other tradition. You can think of humans as right bearers, rights bearers. You know, they bear rights. You can think of different traditions, but they all, if they're thick, if they're deep, they talk in a particular language. They anchor universal commitment through a particular language. I just want to say one very interesting thing. I would say, Maybe the most powerful meditation that is in our tradition of that moment of starting the world with Adam, not with Abraham, not with Exodus, with Adam. There is a Mishnah, I'm sure many of you know that Mishnah, but I always return to that. The Mishnah is a Mishnah in Tractat Sanhedrin, this is a, a second century text, maybe earlier. I think it's the deepest expression in our tradition of the individual and the meaning of an individual. It's about a moment in which witnesses are threatened or are, are warned, not threatened, warned before witnessing in a, in a capital case, in a case of execution. And, and the court says to them, this is a heavy matter. This is life. 
So it's not hearsay, no circumstantial evidence, nothing. It's serious. And they tell him, they ask, Lama nivra adam yechidi? Lefichach nivra adam yechidi? A person was created alone. Why? Shekol ha-me'abed nefesh achat? Ki'ilu ibed olam male. That if you have destroyed one human being, you destroy the whole world. I, this is a powerful, powerful, religiously loaded particular language of the value of each individual, the ultimate value of each individual. Then it says another, it says three things here. And they were born only one couple because God could have started the world with many people. He could have done a real show. You know, hundreds, thousands, millions. Started with a couple. Just a couple. And he says, and the other reason is mipnei shlom abriot, for harmony between people, between creatures. Shelo yomar adam lechavero, abba gadol me'avicha, that a person will not be able to say to another person, my father is greater than your father. This is not about the ultimate value of each individual, it's about the ultimate equality between individuals. Then there is a third thing. To speak the greatness of the King of Kings, HaKadosh Baruch Hu, the Holy Blessed Be He. שאדם תובע מאה מטבעות בחותם אחד וכולם דומים זה לזה. A person makes or shapes coins with one חותם, with one mold, and they all look like one another, but God created one person with one mold, and each, ואין אחד מהם דומה לחברו, and nobody looks like the same. This is the commitment not to the ultimate value, not to the ultimate equality, but a commitment to the ultimate diversity between human beings. That everyone is unique, is different. Lefichach, now a striking sentence in an old text. Lefichach, kol echad veechad lomar, everybody has to say, bishvili nivra haolam. For me, the world was created. Wow. I say, look, this is for me, just, we, we can discuss this at, uh, uh, with great detail, but this is an example of what I would call a universal, a truly universal commitment cast in a thick particular language. So creation is a very particular story of creation. In our tradition, there is a second source of commitment to the world. It doesn't come from creation, because we, in some ways we're all conditioned by creation. The reshit is really the human condition. Death, loneliness, toiling the world, hardship. It's the human condition. But then comes a, a, a commitment that stems from history, not from creation. You should, you should love the foreigner because you were foreigners in Egypt. Doesn't come from creation, comes from a very particular historical moment where the issue is not the generalized ultimate value, equality, and diversity of all humans, it's the empathy to the weak, to the particular vulnerable people in the world, because you were vulnerable. Now, I want to come back to my Israeli commitments. I said I, am, I have commitments as an Israeli. I want a nation state, a Jewish nation state, I do, I'm a Zionist. But I want that nation state to be committed to three things. First, to grant its minorities 
equal standing, one thing. Second, hopefully, this is a, a road, a complicated aim to achieve, is to get the other nation that we have amidst us, the Palestinians, a nation state of their own, in the way we want a nation state. Side by side, this is more complicated. And third, to grant every citizen in our country religious freedom, that he can pursue his religion, his or her religions, as they best see fit. Three issues. By the way, what I'm talking about is called the Declaration of Independence of the State of Israel. A very good text. A beautiful text. Now, if I ask myself, where is this commitment come from? From reading Mill, Locke, that's true as well. But it comes from being true to my Jewish past and my memory of our historical memory as a people. Because we were minorities, because we were denied self-determination, because we were denied religious freedoms and, and the capacity to flourish religiously as a community. All these commitments are a witness clearly to democratic, humanistic values, but to the values of Jewishness, as I mean by that, and the last thing I want is for my country, God forbid, to betray, not democracy, that's a, enough of an issue, but to betray what we are as Jews, to betray our past, our historical memories, and our values. I want to say, lastly, religion is a complex force in history. It plays a very complex role. But when it plays a positive role, it has two powers, two strengths. The first, there is a transcendental anchor. It's not a configuration of history. It's not there is a, a, a way of standing before God with these values. It's a, it gives you a capacity, a, a strong capacity to resist. Because this is a matter of transcendence. And also, being embedded in language, in tradition, in culture, it gives a thickness, a depth to our commitments. And we are trying to figure out, in a serious way, in this world, here in Israel, different places, what does it mean to, be, to bear witness, a genuine witness, to our Jewish commitment? It's part of our story. And I'm trying, I try to outline both what I say as a citizen, as a Jew, some perspective that I come to, I would say, being, being a member of two communities to a certain degree, the US, Israel, and the shared complexity of this situation. So thank you for listening, and I hope you're going to have a good discussion. Thank you very much. <laughs>